Okay. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Maya Chitananda. <laughs> I'm out here in the redwood forests of Santa Cruz Mountains in California. Um, our monastery is called Karuna Buddhist Vihara. And oh, I'm just going to wait a little bit. More people seem to be popping up here and there. <laughs> it's nice to see you all again. I recognize a bunch of people. <laughs> Looks like most people are not in our time zone over here. <laughs> Looks like it's over there. Up in Europe someplace, huh? <laughs> okay, I think, let's see. Yeah, I think everyone can hear, maybe that's enough for now. We'll just start with meditation as usual. <laughs> okay, I can take a couple of nice deep breaths. Maybe you've already had a nice long day and you're kind of tired and Ready for some relaxation? Or maybe you're over here like me in California and it's sort of the middle of your day on a Sunday. Also a good time for relaxation. And starting at the top of our heads. You can try to feel any kind of tension or muscle movement and try to let it relax. Moving down our faces. Maybe if there's any tension in your face, you can kind of scrunch your face up a little bit for a minute as hard as you can. And then just soften and let it relax completely. And allowing your neck and your throat to relax. Allowing any tension in your shoulders to soften. Our necks and our shoulders carry a lot for us. So really giving them a chance to rest and maybe sending them some metta. Lots of gratitude for their hard work. And allowing your upper arms to soften and relax. And your lower arms and your wrists and your hands. Just letting them be comfortable in your lap or however is best for you. And then paying attention to your upper back and your torso in general, your chest and your abdomen, 
and lower back. And adjusting is needed so that you're really comfortable and able to fully relax. Whether you're sitting or standing or laying down. And feeling your hips and your buttocks and pelvis. Making sure they're as comfortable as you can make them too. your thighs and your knees and lower legs and ankles and feet. And if you notice any pain or tension in any part of you, you can either try to soften around it, not fighting against it, but allowing it to be there and softening around the muscles or joints that are having some difficulty. And if that doesn't really help, then maybe trying the technique like we did with our faces of scrunching them up as hard as you can, tightening the muscle as hard as you can for a second, maybe for five seconds and then relaxing completely again. Really taking this opportunity to get in touch with our bodies and allowing them to relax all our body parts. Just let them melt into the seat or the bed or if you're standing, allow yourself to sort of melt into the ground. And if you're having any kind of emotional feelings, trying to see if you can find where it is located in your body, any kind of tension or maybe a sharp feeling or a hard feeling. Just being mindful and present with that feeling, allowing it to be and watching it as it changes and eventually disappears. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Yes. Noticing what kind of mood you might be in mentally. Maybe you're just tired or maybe you're a little bit um, restless or irritated. Maybe you're just really happy and content right now and feeling peaceful. So just being aware of what the mind is up to right now. The general mood. Not buying into the moods, just noticing if it's something not so wholesome, maybe bringing some metta to it instead. Kind of reclining away from any unwholesome moods or feelings. And if it's something wholesome, if it's a wholesome mood or mind state, allowing that to be there and bringing encouragement to it if you need to. And allowing yourself to enjoy it.
And for these last few minutes of meditation, bringing up a sense of mudita for ourselves, that we took the time today to meditate together, and that we have friends on the path who are also working on their own spiritual progress. We can share the merit of our practice with maybe someone in particular or maybe all beings. With the intention of spreading metta and maybe any of the Brahma Viharas as appropriate. Okay, we're all back, I guess. <laughs> um, so today I thought I would talk about reclining towards Nibbana. We, we hear the phrase inclining towards Nibbana a lot. There's uh, several suttas in the Sanyutta Nikaya about it. And it just sounds like a lot of hard work to me. <laughs> it sounds like a lot of like arduous kind of straining uphill towards some lofty goal somewhere out there and it makes me kind of cringe a little bit i'm like ooh. <laughs> so it has that same kind of like ego building kind of feeling and um this forward pulling energy that that i don't find good for my eh, psyche i guess <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'd rather, I'd rather look at Dhamma practice as more of a, a letting go, kind of a Jan Brahm style. You sort of let go of the unwholesome things. You kind of 
recline away from the unwholesome things that really increase our craving and clinging and relax into that peace that naturally occurs with that letting go. So yeah, that's how I see it. <laughs> um, and the, the phrase you see in the suttas is like, mm, they're talking about the great rivers, all the great rivers slant slope and incline towards the ocean. But I don't, I don't know of any river that actually flows uphill on an incline towards the ocean. So yeah, it's like, instead of, um, instead of the Pali word they have for it is Pabara, Pabara, P-A-B-B-H-A-R-A. -A -A. And it means, it, it does mean incline or like going up a mountain slope, but it also means leading to or heading towards. So I like that translation better. So like heading towards Nibbana or leading towards Nibbana. And um, so it says like in the same way, a practitioner who develops and cultivates the Eightfold Path slants slopes and heads towards Nibbana. So I thought we'd talk a little bit about the Noble Eightfold Path, even though I'm sure most of you are pretty familiar with it, but can't hurt to have a little review. <laughs> Um, so let me pull up the sutta really quick. Uh, in the Samyutta Nikaya, it's 45.8. It's the Webanga Sutta, if you want to look it up. Um, it's the, the Eightfold Path, kind of where he lays it all out and does a little analysis of it. And it says, um, and what bhikkhus is right view? And then he goes through the um, Four Noble Truths, knowledge of suffering, knowledge of the origin of suffering, knowledge of the cessation of suffering, and knowledge of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. And then right intention, and those are kind of the basic ones are um, renunciation, goodwill, or non-ill will is actually like the poly for it. It just says not ill will, which I kind of find encouraging because sometimes when you're having difficulties with people and and goodwill is too much of a stretch then you just have to like not have ill will and that's kind of good enough like the intention of of just not not being um hateful or having any anger towards them and then um the intention of harmlessness so it's renunciation non-ill will and harmlessness and so those, those first two of the path are the sort of wisdom factors. And then they go through right speech. And it's a little bit more than just not telling lies. It's the false speech and avoiding um, divisive speech, harsh speech, idle chatter or gossip. So that's the right speech bit. And then right action is the precepts, basically the first three precepts, not killing, not taking what is not given, um, no sexual misconduct, and um, right livelihood is the next factor. And it's basically, um, there's a list in another sutta, a couple of different lists actually, but there are five livelihoods that are not recommended by the Buddha. He says, try to avoid these. <laughs> so no trading in weapons or living creatures animals and people. I mean, slavery was going on still in the Buddhist time. So now we have human trafficking and scary things. So yeah, not that. <laughs> um, meat or butchery, don't trade in meat. Don't be a butcher. No selling intoxicants and um, poisons. And so these are the sila parts of the Noble Eightfold Path. And I like to think of it as like, if you have good sila, you can really sort of recline towards nibbana. You can rest or um, rest in the safety and the knowledge that you've got pretty good karma. You haven't really done anything wrong and you're kind of safe in a lot of ways. <laughs> safe for other people and also for your karma. Um, and then I like, I also like, I'm sure most of you know Ajahn Brahm's method of like acknowledge, forgive, and learn. He likes to call it his AFL method. So like everybody makes mistakes with the sila sometimes. We're all human, stuff happens. But 
Um, it's also really important to remember to not hang on to the past and sort of let it eat away at you when it's not really helping anything. We had, like, when, growing up, this this movie was big in my generation, like, um, and I don't know, maybe other people too have heard of this movie called The um, A League of Their Own. Anybody know? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> okay, so it was about um, women playing baseball during, I think, World War II because the men were all off to war. And they have this coach and he's kind of, you know, the women are kind of upset about something the coach is doing, I think. And, and he's yelling at them, there's no crying in baseball. So now I, I think there's no crying in baseball and there's no guilt in Buddhism <laughs> because guilt doesn't really help any of us. But we all, we all kind of beat ourselves up for no good reason. So Ajahn Brahm's AFL method, method is really good because we do acknowledge when we made a mistake or if someone else made a mistake um, regarding Sila, like sometimes it's, it's um, not some kind of Sila issue and we still beat ourselves up for it. So like we, we say something that's socially awkward or we, I don't know, um, accidentally drop something and it breaks and we've ruined somebody's object. And it's a good kind of scale for us to look at when we talk about Sila. It's like, did I actually break any precepts? And that's kind of a good, like doing something wrong. It's, it's a good gauge of like, did I actually do something bad karmically? Or is it just an accident or a mistake or whatever? So yeah, I think, I think it's good not to beat ourselves up. <laughs> okay, um, where were we? We were talking about livelihood. And so next is right effort. And this one I think is a big kind of sticking point for, or I don't know, sticking point, but it's a big um, topic when I think about um, reclining towards Nibbana, because this is the one where you hear about striving so much. And in the suttas, it does say you kind of like apply your mind and strive, arouse energy, make effort. And it's, it's again, this like, mm, more of a letting go. If, if you're trying too hard and it's building up your sense of self and you're straining, there's not going to be enough peace around it for you. So it's more about letting go of, of basically everything in the world um, for the sake of the freedom and happiness that's really only found in Nibbana, like through attaining Nibbana. Like, um, you're going to come back if, if not, if you don't make it, <laughs> you're just going to be reborn anyway. So really having mm, the will is not quite the right word, but the willingness, maybe the willingness to really let go of everything. What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> so yeah, trying to let go, um, with that sense of, of uh, contentment and peacefulness around it. It's like, and of course with right intention too, not all that straining. Um, it makes me think of that sutta with the, the lute player. You have to tune your lute properly, not too loose, not too tight, if you want it to sound good. So right effort is kind of like that. And the basics in the sutta are you want to, uh, stop doing things that are unwholesome, not letting unwholesome mind states take over um, the ones that have already arisen and then s preventing the ones from coming up that have, have not yet arisen unwholesome mind states and the same for the uh, wholesome ones. Continue bringing up the wholesome mind states and, and bringing up new wholesome states that have not yet been um, created. <laughs> um, and yeah, kind of right, right effort does go along with right mindfulness and right stillness, which are next. So if you have enough effort, you can, the other two can be uh, fulfilled more. I heard something the other day, I was listening to Ajahn Sona, who's a monk up in Canada, 
and he says right effort is like gardening I thought that was kind of fun so you pull the weeds of the unwholesome mental states out and you nourish the veggies and fruits of the wholesome mind states and he was talking about like um the unwholesome things that come up in meditation like the five hindrances preventing those from arising and dealing with them appropriately when they have arisen and then developing the seven factors of enlightenment and um you probably Maybe we'll just do a little refresher for fun in case anybody wants to know about the, the five hindrances are essential desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness and doubt, and the enlightenment factors that you want to grow are um, mindfulness, investigation of states or dhammas, energy, PT, um, or joy, tranquility, um, stillness. I like stillness better than concentration for samadhi and equanimity. So those um, enlightenment factors too need to be done with enough balance, just like the loot thing. And I like Bhante Analyo's way of thinking about the seven enlightenment factors. He says it's like, um, it's like surfing. He calls it Bojanga surfing. So you kind of balance out if you're getting a little too energetic, then you work on the, the tranquility aspect or maybe some more stillness or something um and you kind of mindfulness is sort of in the middle and then you kind of balance out the the energizing side with the calming sides so that's kind of fun <laughs> and then um oh yeah so next is right mindfulness and in in the sutta it really only the buddha talks about like the four establishments of mindfulness so a lot of the things we hear kind of in the secular Buddhist world, it, it can apply, um, but usually it's not, it's not in a perfect fit. You do have to have the right intention and the right view behind it for it to work. So the four, four establishments of mindfulness um, are really what he's talking about here. And then um, I, I find having that mindfulness really um helps me to like recline away from the objects of craving and clinging that i have and you sort of recline back towards nibbana and away from the the stuff that gets you stuck here forever <laughs> so um i find that with technology it's very it's very like um forward pulling like screen time you're kind of inclined towards the screens and i think a lot of the times it's just craving to know stuff like how often do i get on the internet just to learn stuff that may or may not be so useful for anything <laughs> it's just kind of curiosity and and it does stir up other mind states that are not maybe the best um even on accident like you see things while you're browsing for something and something else pops up that like takes your attention away from what you're actually trying to learn about so having enough mindfulness to um, notice the feeling of that inclining feeling that's driven by craving is really useful for stopping yourself basically and, and pulling back from the unwholesome. And then the last one I think was, we got to concentration by now. So <laughs> I like stillness better, of course. And so in the suttas, the Buddha is basically just going through the four jhanas there but yep so the last three are the samadhi factors i mean the um yeah samadhi factors i guess you could say the sort of sila samadhi and panya they usually break up the um, enlightenment factor i mean the um eightfold path factors into so yeah i i i guess i just really enjoy the idea of reclining away from the unwholesome and that automatically pulls you back towards the wholesome and yeah it's a it's a much more easeful way of looking at reclining towards nibbana i think that's all i had to say really so um we can spend the rest of the time with q a if you like if anyone has questions maybe derek and kelly can help me see what's up <laughs> So if you're new here, then you can raise your 
virtual hand to ask a question by pressing on the raise hand button at the bottom of the Zoom page. Or you can try also waving at the screen and I'll see if I can see you and we'll send you an invitation to unmute. And perhaps while we're waiting for other questions, I will ask the first one. And I wonder if I, you could give us some of your personal experiences of having put too much effort into your practice and how it affected your practice. Samples. So I was doing a Mahasi retreat for a month. One time, this was... Mm, eight or nine years ago, maybe something like that. And I, they're pretty intense, those Mahasi retreats. It's a lot of sitting and um, a lot of very slow walking meditation practice. So I, I once sat for like, I don't know, it must have been over three hours, it might have been closer to four, because they ring a bell for you to get up every hour, I think, and you're not supposed to move, um, switch postures in between those times. So I was, I was really enjoying the first hour and then I just kept staying and then I, I missed it every time <laughs> they rang the bell to switch postures. And for the next like two or three days, my knees were really upset with me. And I, I know a lot of at least two or three other monks um, who have done the same kind of similar things and really hurt their bodies. So, you know, it's good to be mindful of your body and, and not overdo it. Um, it depends too on, on how the meditation is going. If you're in a really deep state, you can do it without pain afterwards. It just won't hurt at all. Um, but yeah, if, if you're trying too much and it's not really hitting the right note, then you're probably in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. And I will ask Shaila, Sheila, Shaila <laughs> to unmute. And if I can find her on the oh, there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there should be an invitation. Okay, you are muted, so you should be able to speak now. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Aya Chitananda. My name is Sheila. I'm in Stockton. And I would love to, um, I really resonated with your description or metaphor of stillness versus concentration. Could you talk more about that? Because um, I try to really, in my daily practice um, and at specific times, really integrate the Eightfold Path and so the and and the Seven Factors of Awakening. Uh, so the understanding and working with concentration from stillness sounds like a um, a possibility and softer and more manageable as well. So if you could talk more about that, thank you. Sure. Well, I think what you said, Sheila, was beautiful. So <laughs> maybe I don't have much to say besides that. I think it does kind of go with the theme of um, being too tight. Concentration, you kind of narrow down on something and you kind of get, you know, you want to get one pointed, you know, and it's, it's, um, 
that kind of striving, that kind of tightness really sort of blocks up our abilities in some ways to let go. And a lot of this really is about that letting go and not having a sense of clinging, like mm -hmm. a sense of trying to attain the concentration in that way and just allowing it to come naturally and sort of um, putting down burdens, putting down the things that we're clinging to and hanging on to that we don't need to be. Um, yeah, I, I like Ajahn Brahm's descriptions a lot too about the stillness because it is that idea of, of not, not too tight, not too goal oriented. So we can look at more talks. He'll do a much better job at describing it than I can. <laughs> yeah. And Leah is next. Hey, thank you, Derek. Hi, Aya Chitananda. Thank you very much uh, for, for sharing the meditation and your thoughts with us. Um, I've got, um, uh, I've had a really hard time practicing over the last month uh, because a lot of stuff happening with work, but also personally. So I've actually given myself a break. <laughs> You know, I, I um, I've stopped practice. I've stopped trying to practice because I've just I'm working such a long time, such long hours, and it's pretty. It's, it's just a lot of pressure on me. And so I just try to. I don't know. Sometimes have ten conscious breaths. You know, and I find <laughs> that, I find that it's, it works better. I mean, I find it works better this way than trying to have a practice when I really can't. I mean, I'm I'm not in the space to. To practice but at the same time I think to myself well that's a kind of a bit of an excuse to not practice <laughs> um, but then I do I do practice on, on Saturdays and you know Sundays I try and join the group and I just think that um, sometimes it's a better practice I don't, to have that compassion for ourselves but again you know then I I have that guilt well I don't want to say that but that you know you were talking about guilt when you I mean we are that I that I should try harder or so it's kind of a difficult balance um so I, I wanted your advice on that if if you wouldn't mind yeah I mean it is hard to find time a lot of the time and when you're feeling stressed out so I do like your idea of 10 mindful breaths and if you can do that a few times during the day, that's already good. And, and making sure you come on the weekends is good too, when you do have time. There's a lot involved in practice. I mean, you can look at the whole Eightfold Path and, and see that you are doing at least some of those things every day, you know, and remembering that, reminding yourself and encouraging yourself to, to do more of that mm, or maybe even not do more because as you say, it's hard and you don't want to like guilt yourself, but to realize that you are practicing, you're probably trying to be mindful of your body speech and mind, your actions. And that's already really good. I don't know what kind of livelihood you have, but that's probably fine too. I mean, as long as it's not one of those five things, it's like, okay, going to work today, it's a wholesome kind of job. And if it's not, you can change that. <laughs> but you know, just looking at like enlightenment factors throughout the day too. It's like, you don't have to be formally sitting on your cushion to practice those either. I mean, um, I don't know what your favorite one would happen to be, but if I think yeah. about- No, no, I, 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 this is, this resonates because uh, I do think about that um, all the time, you know, mm -hmm. especially because uh, I've had a few conflicts going on the last few weeks and it's really hard to, you know, to just think, don't think, when you were talking about, just don't think them any, any ill and it's enough, you know, that was quite comforting, you know, because yeah. it's hard sometimes when you're in a conflict situation to forgive or be good, but at least don't wish them any ill. That's very good, good advice. Good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. 
Yeah, good. I think a lot of a lot of the things the Buddha says, there's another sutta, um, the Salaika Sutta, I think, called effacement. And a lot of the things that are in that sutta, we probably are doing, we are practicing. And a good three or four of them at the beginning are like, just not that, <laughs> just non-ill will, just non-hatred. It's it's enough. So yeah, we can comfort ourselves because it's good. <laughs> yeah and yeah um putting energy into wholesome things at work putting energy into remembering to speak kindly is good um remembering to do something good for yourself too taking care of your own body that's good yeah things like that i don't know <laughs> thank you that's that's a, that, that's great thank you very much okay, good. <laughs> Hi, James, it's you next. So. <laughs> Hi, James. Oh, I can be heard. Yeah. Thank you for the talk, Aya. Um, <clears throat> so, with, with meditation, I, I, I always, well, trying and I think succeeding in approaching it without sort of expectations and just with a an attitude of sort of letting go but still you you kind of wonder you know am I, am I getting better at this you know is it improving is it deepening and and I, th I think like uh, I mean I kind of think it is because I seem to be getting a lot better at sort of like um, relaxing the body and sort of finding a, a sort of still place in the mind um, but I mean it, it, you know is is there thing well not things to be looking out for but um how do you know if, if you know other objective ways of sort of judging i mean i mean one one thing is one concrete thing i ask is that i thought a long long time ago i read in one of ajahn brahm's books that um if you're reaching quite a deep state you sort of lose sense of the body mm -hmm. and yet i remember i was listening to a talk with i think it's bante sadas I think I mispronounced that almost. I know <laughs> him. He's, he... <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, excellent. But I think I think he said that um, that if you, I think he said he said something like if you lose feeling you know uh, awareness of your body, then see me at the end or something like it was a bad thing. So, <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> but so so just I mean, like I said, I don't want to be sort of looking out for things or striving for something or or pushing or anything because I, I think I think like I say I think I'm quite good with just sort of relaxing 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 and just sort of letting whatever happens happens naturally I suppose but still is there any signs that I'm being successful I suppose sorry that was very long-winded and probably a bit garbled but I'm trying <laughs> no it's okay <laughs> I think I understood <laughs> I mean there's nothing wrong with losing losing uh, your sense of the body. It's it's a good thing, probably. I mean, you hear about it where you, you um, <laughs> again with that Mahasi retreat a while ago. <laughs> that was kind of a thing. It's it's a good thing, um, and I like I like that you're acknowledging not to be kind of grasping after it or trying to attain something, but a lot of the times. It, it might feel like not much is going on meditation in your meditation, like not much progress is happening, but it's something more objective you can look at because I, I don't have the ability to like encompass my mind with your mind, like it says in the suttas. So I can't tell you just talking about it, but looking at your life, looking at um, people in your life, and sometimes people will if you if you live with somebody especially or some co-workers they'd be like um did you meditate today because you're a little grumpy or something <laughs> you know and they can tell when you're not practicing <laughs> and just seeing like are you kinder in your life are are people kind of um more trusting of you and looking to you as somebody who they can feel safe with and comfortable with and seeing if if you're grumpy more even I mean, looking at your own mind states throughout the day is a good indicator, I think, of how you're doing with meditation. And 
the softening, um, the letting go and softening that you do during your meditation should have an effect when you're out and about in the world. Like there should be a softening and a relaxation in your life too. And so I think that's one of probably the best indicators of how it's going. Right, excellent. That's um, that's actually very useful because uh, so so you, you're not looking at the meditation time. You're looking at the time when you're not meditating. That's a good time to figure out. Yeah, uh, kind of. <laughs> I mean, if you're having really deep jhana states and you come out of the jhana in in between the end of your meditation and the jhana, then you can do more contemplation and examination. That's great. And if you can't. This is even better in some ways because <laughs> the whole path is not just the meditation. You, we do need all of the Eightfold Path for this to be effective. So, yeah, it's good. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Hi, David. You, you, you are asked to mute, I think. <laughs> Thanks, Aya Chitananda, for the very peaceful meditation and the talk. <laughs> I find it interesting to do with kind of letting go. I liked when you mentioned about the peace that you feel when you're letting go. And I used to kind of think I was quite good at letting go. And then I realized I wasn't that good as I thought I was. <laughs> it's interesting that, yeah, there always, there seems to be always something else that could be kind of let go of. Yeah, it's, it's odd. And I do, I do get kind of quite peaceful feelings when meditating. Mm -hmm. But it's still, there seems always to be kind of something still to be let go of yeah that's just to say that really yeah <laughs> yeah i mean oh there's still stuff to let go of until you're a non-returner it just keeps we're still clinging somewhere there's there's ignorance somewhere there's this sense of self in us still all the way up until the end so yeah you're right david there is always something else we can let go of and even even if we attain nibbana in this life, there's something else we can let go of, this body. <laughs> so, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I like what you were saying to James about in, in the kind of non-meditation life, the kind of real world or out when you're not meditating. Yeah, it's good to kind of see if there are any improvements in how we kind of react to the world around us or if we do still get frustrated by things, which I, I do admit I do sometimes, <laughs> life is still a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, challenge. I'm thinking of like, we went to Thailand a couple of years ago before the pandemic and we got to see a bunch of monks who are supposedly arahants. And it's like, the word challenge is interesting because some of them still have difficulties with their bodies. You know, they have diabetes or um, joint problems or, you know, things that we all can't avoid with all this aging sickness and death stuff. Right. And it's like, for them, it's not so much a challenge. It's something they have to sort of put up with and manage, but the feeling of it being a challenge isn't there. It's just, like the equanimity around it, the acceptance and and peace around it, realizing that this is just samsara and until they let go of the body at the end, it's just, it's always gonna be something to deal with. So yeah, I don't know. <laughs>
Thank you. Sure. I lost James to unmute again. Hello. I hope it's okay to ask one more thing. Sure. Okay. Um, so what you said was very helpful and um, I have no doubt the practice has had a really serious effect on the rest of my life and I'm you know, really pleased with that and it's, it's, it's good. I'm sort of like, well, I won't go through <laughs> the benefits because it's hard to say really, isn't it? It's actually uh, it's a funny thing really because it happens so gradually, you, you almost don't notice, do you? You just realise one day. It's kind of like um, how I realised one day I'd lost interest in certain, say, more unwholesome, say, TV or film programmes, things like that. It's just like stuff I used to watch in the olden days. All of a sudden, it's not It's not like I made a decision that it was bad to watch this thing, but all of a sudden I just found myself not interested. But, um, yeah, these things change slowly and, yeah. But um, but it kind of leads into my other question, though, is I, I think what's, what's probably bugging me or having problems with me at the minute really is that um having sort of brought it out to my sort of broader life but off the mat so to speak I kind of found like I've lost interest and enthusiasm and drive for things that I probably should be doing you know I mean I, I'm fortunate that I don't have a lot of ties you know I don't have family to care for it well I do but I don't have kids to care for and I don't have a particularly high powered job, so that's not too demanding. But there are other, other things that I should be doing, you know. I, you know, I'm not, unfortunately, I don't have to motivate myself to be, get on the cushion or do Dharma study, and that obviously takes up some time now. And I'm more inclined towards doing that. Whereas, like, there's, there's sort of like business things I probably should be doing, but since I don't have to do them, they don't get done. And, it, you know, I sort of, it's sort of, a, I guess, I guess, losing of interest in the sort of, wider life and the things that I used to have enthusiasm and drive to do and which I really should be doing I'm not doing so much <laughs> again I'm babbling aren't I no. <laughs> well what, what do you do like I say is you're losing interest in these things but probably should still be doing them you know it's uh, yeah. yeah yeah there's a lot of things that I don't know you kind of get more and more into practice and interest in Dhamma and less out in the world seems interesting and then sometimes you just have to shave your head and put on some robes and go to a monastery and <laughs> do that <laughs> but i mean you know it, we we do need to be responsible if if you've got a job you've got to do and you've got to make a living to take care of yourselves and help people um then sometimes finding something that is interesting to you more Dhamma practice and study is good, but sometimes some kind of charity is also good. Something that really makes your heart happy and you have the opportunity to be generous with other people. That might be a good place to put your energy and interest in if work is just kind of perfunctory or whatever, <laughs> you know? So I don't know. I think that's what I would say. Find something wholesome that is interesting to you and put, put some energy into it, whether you feel like it or not, you know, kind of having the accountability keeps you doing wholesome things and keeps the good karma momentum going. So I think that's all I would say. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm thinking that maybe I should just find a new direction in life, but uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you shave your head, you put on some robes yeah. and <laughs> go to the monastery. <laughs> yeah, no. I have to be honest, I, I, yeah. Yeah, I'm being down on myself. I can't imagine anyone anyone taking me, but uh <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. Thailand's got a lot of places. <laughs> am I am I am I correct in thinking that you have to be debt free before you can ordain? 
Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's, yeah. It is a yeah, it stops a bunch of people. It takes a long time to yeah, dig yourself out. But um, like you said, maybe you just need a new job or something. <laughs> that's perhaps more a practical proposition. Uh -huh. also, also, is, is it true you have to get your parents' permission? Um well in the Vinaya it it does say that. I think in the West, a lot of the times people don't really hold too tightly to that rule because people don't really understand what you're doing. Like in Asia, the concept is more familiar of people going off and ordaining or being some kind of spiritual seeker. And um, it's good if you have to, if you are responsible for your parents in some ways. Um, but I know a lot of monastics monks who have taken care of their parents when they've gotten old so they've kind of you know stayed monks and just went back home looked mm -hmm. after them for years at a time some of them you know and that's just fine um so that's that's kind of a nice way of reassuring your parents <laughs> if if they're not into this it's like well all these other monks and nuns do this and so it's a thing and it's okay i'll still be able to look after you when you need me um yeah so yes and no i mean a lot of monks and nuns have ordained without getting their parents permission and then kind of just easing them into it over time kind of showing them that they are happy and that it's working out for them and that usually makes their parents more okay with it over time <laughs> Can I ask just one more thing? It's sort of a, I don't know, maybe a slightly silly question. Mm -hmm. I always, uh, the the descriptions of Arahant seem so, um, I don't know, not far out or it's hard to imagine being an Arahant. So I'd imagine if, if I knew someone and then they went away and sort of came back and they'd become enlightened, I'd imagine that, that the difference would be like immediately noticeable, like they'd sort of glow with it or something. Yeah, would do, do do you think that would be the case? I mean, you know, if if, if someone you knew closely went away, came back, and they they achieved nirvana, would you instantly be able to tell? Do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, it froze a little. My internet seems to be having trouble. Mm, okay, unfroze. Great. <laughs> yeah, I I definitely do feel a different energy with people. Um, having met several monks who are uh, reputed to be enlightened and mm -hmm. and one Mechi too one nun in thailand who lives near a monk's monastery that the the monk is supposedly enlightened he supports this nun's monastery and she's reputed to be enlightened too and it's definitely a different energetic feeling um one way i i can kind of describe it i kind of experience it as like nobody's there it's like there's this person, there's this body, um, they're talking to you and it's all on the surface, it seems normal, but there's like no one there somehow. It's like the sense of self has dropped away completely and it's just a different feeling energetically. I don't know how else to describe it besides that. <laughs> so I'm sure if it's someone you knew well, you would be able to tell. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. And next is Lee. It's very good to see you for your first time, I think, here. Hi. <laughs> yes, it's my first time. It's lovely to be here. I'm I, So I'm new to the, the Sunday Sangha, but I've attended quite a few of Venerable Chanda's talks um, and really love them. So... I'm really glad to be here. I'm not sure if I've got a question, um, more a sharing that your talk really resonated so much with me, so many aspects and, oh, so many things. <laughs> I, I think that there was a phrase that was in my head today, I just thought I'd share. Um, it was from actually from Joseph Goldstein. He said, um, I think he was having a hard time on retreat. Well, I can't remember the details, but his teacher had said, ah, oh, um, contemplate your sila. And that phrase, contemplate your sila, has been with me today. 
all through my day. And at first he took it the wrong way. And this is why I really related to it. He thought he was being criticized. You better think about your sila, but his teacher was trying to help him find um, pleasure, uplift in his actions. And I was reminding myself that today, because I can be really, really hard on myself. So um, I find even small conflict very difficult. If there's a ripple in my personal relationships, I think I search myself deeply, perhaps blame. And <laughs> so there's just been a few little family ripples. And even though I've not been to blame or necessarily directly involved, it's been quite, uh, I realized it's been a good learning because I was, it's taken up some of my mind and thinking, what can I do? What can I do? And then I thought, when I contemplated my sila and thinking about the Eightfold Path, it brought me great comfort because I could think about my intention and my actions that are, I, I hope, wholesome and good. And yeah, so this big expectation I could put on myself can sort of soften, I think is what I was finding. I'm working in my garden. <laughs> and, <laughs> I'm finding it softening and thinking, oh, actually this is really helping this change of perspective this which is all about solidifying the self isn't it ultimately as well so the try softening that um, uh, yeah I found great sort of calming and peace and um, that that's that's just um, my sharing Aww, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Lee. That was beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, the the whole not not liking any kind of conflict thing, I think is so common for so many of us. I have that too. I don't really like conflict. And for me, I think I think you kind of got it, Lee. It's this sense of self thing. It's like I don't want to be bad or do something bad or have someone upset with me. And then when, when I investigate further for myself, it's kind of like a, almost a survival mechanism kind of thing deep down in there where like, I want to be safe. And if, if I have trouble with someone, there's some kind of, you know, something's wrong. I'm not going to be okay. Kind of a feeling. Yeah. I don't know. That's a big one for so many people have, have, um, brought this up about not liking conflict <laughs> even little tiny things so that i resonate with what you said <laughs> yeah. I'm happy for more questions or sharing if you'd like, and I'm happy to just sit here and meditate with you if you'd like until <laughs> someone comes up with something or or not. I can see Leah has a question, but quickly I'd like to ask as well, what is the danger or where is the danger in reclining too much in the practice? What yeah. is there a danger? <laughs> um, there's no danger if you're doing it right. <laughs> it's not it's not like a laziness it's not like um pulling back from reality it's actually reclining closer to reality and um ultimate truth so you do want to put in enough effort it's not a lazy reclining <laughs> you do have to make sure you are following the eightfold path making sure you are meditating and having good sila and everything um, but 
there's no there's no danger in pulling like reclining as far away as you can from unwholesome things. <laughs> Great, thanks. Here's Leah. Okay. Thanks, Eric. Um, I just uh, I just want to go back to the conflict issue. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking about also when James was was asking, was sharing. Um, I think that well, uh, my practice has made me really see that the, you know there is a witness, and you know a lot of the time, well, a lot of what we do, a lot of what we think is our personality and where we are is actually our conditioning. And for me, like my practice, my meditation, and you know, to, to, as you said, to practice it all the time, I can see that I can see myself doing things that I think are my character, but they're actually our conditioning. Like, for example, I have this tendency where somebody hurts me or upsets me, or that's something that I just, I just walk away. Like, I, I'll just leave, I, I'll just move on, you know, because I, um, I find it hard to, to have that, conf I just don't like to have that confrontation, and I just, I, just, I just leave them behind, you know, move on with my life. And I, a lot of it, I think, is, is self-preservation and I can really see this trait in myself you know and something has happened over the last few weeks and I, I'm really trying to sort of um, have a little bit of a discussion with myself well, myself the self you know <laughs> uh, <laughs> to see well how can you can you do something can you can you try and do something different this time you know can you try and maybe you know forgive this person and just, you know, carry on with the friendship, see if you can, and for the first time I see some kind of opening, but you know, it's a very small opening, um, but I can see how you, you can change it. We can change it, uh, but it's really hard. It takes such, it takes such a, a kind, kindness towards ourselves but it takes negotiation with ourselves it takes patience and all of these things and it's quite amazing how it really is invisible the change but it it does happen because I just can see how I'm reluctant to just leave this person behind because I'm thinking mm. and you know and then I I go back to oh no 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 I'm just gonna move on I'm gonna move on move on but it's and I guess and, and then I, I also realized over the last, I don't know, however long, many weeks, months, is that, you know, it is all about relationships. This It's about we how we relate ourselves with other people all the time, with ourselves, with other people. And it's that keeping that, I don't know, openness and holding back from reacting and uh, just, it, I think patience is probably one of the best virtues to cultivate you know to and kindness towards ourselves I, I i don't know if i'm making any sense here but uh, basically the big issue in my life at the moment is conflict and feeling hurt but trying to find a different way of reacting which for the first time in my life is happening it's quite a uh, groundbreaking i think you know in, in a way yeah yeah i think that's great i mean if we just keep pushing people away all the time, we're gonna end up pretty lonely, I think, you know? <laughs> if we just kind of push everyone away like that. And I love that you're trying something different because that's what Buddhism is all about is going against our conditioning and training ourselves to be different, um, to act in more wholesome ways. And it looks like you're doing great with like examining your mind and, and having that patience and not going with the conditioning and seeing that so much of our, our wiring our character is conditioning is really helpful then we don't blame ourselves too much we don't we're not as harsh with ourselves when we aren't doing it um doing it right like making the most wholesome choices we can forgive ourselves and and try to change from it learn from what we've done so i really appreciated your sharing that was that was really nice thank you leah <laughs> Thank you. 
Does anybody have any last questions or comments? Then I will say to Ayachit Nanda, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you so much for the reminder to practice the Eightfold Path, all of the factors and not just selected ones. <laughs> and also, okay. thank you for your generosity in taking the time to answer our questions. And I would like to just quickly post in the chat box the website for Ayachit Nanda's monastery, where I was hearing before we started that they're currently or just about to start constructing kutis. So the monastery will be growing and there'll be more space for people. And that's just wonderful to see the bhikkhuni sangha growing and the space for bhikkhunis to grow, especially. So if you would like to visit this website, you can find out more about the monastery and about the projects. And if you would like to support and continue to be part of our project as the Anukampa Project, you can find the donate information at anukampaproject.org forward slash donate. And thank you again, Ajitananda, and I look forward to seeing you all again very soon. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, thank you for having me. I always appreciate this group. Everybody's pretty um, serious about practice, and that's always encouraging to see a bunch of people getting together for meditation and Dhamma discussion. So thank you for having me.